So as the tank continues, we extend our losing record to 17 and 30 before we get a phone call from assistant coach Darvin Ham. He tells me that Bob Sanderson's been in the locker room talking pretty loudly about trading for TJ McConnell and it's got some of the players upset. All throughout the season, I've tried to be pretty open with everyone on the team and in the front office and now we've got them all asking about what's going on. He said that Mike Budenholzer has been trying to do some damage control but things really have to be sorted out so I tell him I'll talk to Sanderson ASAP. Before I can do that though, Bellinelli goes down with a pinched nerve in his back for about two weeks, which puts Bembry back in the starting lineup. Malcolm Delaney then comes into my office voicing his concern over the whole Sanderson thing, and that he's apparently the one on the trading block. I try to calm him down and explain him that I'm the GM, and that I'll have the final say in trades. As unprofessional as it is, Sanderson can talk all he wants, but any and all personnel changes have to go through me. He's really not buying it, and is still uneasy about everything, but I gave him my word that at the moment, I have absolutely no intention of trading him. He takes it begrudgingly, but at least it looks like we squashed the issue for the time being. After losing two more games to put our record at 17 and 32, we finally get news that Ilyasov is back on his feet and ready to be put back in the lineup. We switch him out with Mescal, who's actually been doing much better this past month, averaging 12 points and 8 rebounds a game, playing out of position. But Illy's been our guy all season, so we're going back to the way that things were. In the wake of the good news, I decide to call Sanderson about his big mouth in the locker room. He keeps trying to interrupt me, but I say my piece, telling that no matter what his intentions were, it's f***ing up the vibes on the team and is a really bad look when we're openly talking about trading people in front of our players and staff. He half-heartedly apologizes, saying that he apparently feels like a kid with a treasure map or something when he looks at the player efficiency ratings, which makes it hard for him to keep his emotions in check. You'd think that someone who's risen up in the corporate world and made enough money to own a f***ing NBA franchise would be able to handle himself professionally. He says he understands what I'm saying, but I still don't think he really gets it, so I tell him that it honestly might be best if he just stays out of the locker room altogether and I leave it at that. Things stay pretty uneventful for the next two weeks, and we reach the day of the trade deadline with a 19-32 and record. I would have liked to lose a few more games at this point so we have a better chance in the draft, since our Houston Rockers first rounder has no chance in the lottery, but I've really liked how our young guys and role players have been developing and gelling as a team. And then, with a couple minutes left before the trade deadline, I'm hit with some f up news. Apparently, Andrew Sanderson goes over my head without consulting me and trades Malcolm Delaney for TJ McConnell. He comes into my office to explain, but I'm Although Delaney was never a long-term part of our plan, he was a solid producer who never caused any waves. He played his role on the team well, and just a few weeks ago, I had just given him my word that we wouldn't be trading him. So now I'm looking pretty f***ed in the rest of the organization's eyes. He tried to play it off and say that he knew I wanted McConnell, and that since there wasn't enough time to call both myself and his dad, he skipped me and got the approval from him. I tell him that I don't give a f***. If there's three seconds before the deadline, he needs to use two of those seconds to call me before he makes a roster move. If there's not enough time, then the trade doesn't happen. Now, it's not that I don't want McConnell. Like I mentioned in the last video, he's a young pass-first guard who can be a pest on defense and is always looking for the open guy. But it's just the principle of the matter that has me pissed off. How am I supposed to keep control over my guys when it looks like I don't even have any say in my own job? He keeps on trying to justify himself, but I tell him to get the hell out of my office and try not to trade anyone on the way. But now with the trade through and the deadline over, there's not much I can do about the situation, but go with it. So we get McConnell into the rotation and have him at 25 minutes as our sixth man. Understandably, Dennis Schroeder takes an issue with this and comes to me. He's already shown he's a little paranoid about his job security back in the beginning of the season and voices his concern over it again. I decide against just straight up telling him that I had no part in the matter and explain that the move was actually to add more depth. His minutes and touches aren't going to be affected and McConnell is coming in as a facilitator. Schroeder will start at the point guard and McConnell Connell will be leading the second squad. At times, I might use them both on the floor together, but in those cases, we'll be running plays to set Schroeder up for some open looks. I think Schroeder's been reassured, so we move on with our sights on the All-Star break. But, of course, just when I think we're in the clear, McConnell comes in complaining about his role on the team. I mean, I can kind of see where he's coming from. He went from an important cog in a playoff-bound team to a bottom dweller, and he expects to be one of the best players there. I tell him to relax, though. He's still new and getting integrated with their system. We'll see as we play more games how he fits in and that if his performance warrants it, and if so, we can talk about a starting spot. He doesn't leave too happy, but it's nothing serious. So for the All-Star break, we see that Schroeder didn't make the East team. Looking through the roster, I'm pretty surprised that Kyrie Irving was snubbed as well. We have DeMar DeRozan, John Wall, LeBron, the Greek Freak, and Hassan Whiteside as the starters, with Kyle Lowry, Bradley Beal, Batum, Kevin Love, Andre Drummond, Kemba Walker, and the process of Joel Embiid coming off the bench. 
for the West, we have the usual suspects, Westbrook, Harden, Durant, Leonard, and Cat. All starting with Curry, McCollum, Paul George, Anthony Davis, Gobert, Lillard, and Draymond Green rounding out the rest of the squad. We had much better luck with the rookie sophomore game though, with Torian Prince making the stars team, and Bembry making us proud and sneaking onto the leaps. Now, if you didn't notice, we see two names under unfamiliar teams making the all-star roster. Taking a look at their transactions report, we see that on December 9th, the Hornets and the Heat made a blockbuster deal with Miami sending their top big man, Hassan Whiteside and Wayne Ellington for Nick Batum and Frank Kaminsky. After their inspiring comeback season last year, this trade makes absolutely no sense to me. Elite big men are really hard to come by, especially in this day and age, and it's clear that trading him is a sign that they're in tank mode. Considering that the Heat don't have a first round pick this year though, I have no idea what they're doing. We also see Kenneth Fareed getting sent to the Bucks for Della Vadova and a second rounder, which makes me pretty happy for the power forward who paid his dues in Denver for too many years. With his rebounding and ridiculous motor, the Manimal just made the Bucks that much scarier come playoff time. The rest are a bunch of irrelevant trades. The Thunder sent Pat Peterson and Kyle Singler to the Clips for Wesley Johnson and Willie Reed. And the Hornets sent Cody Zeller in a first to the Lakers for Jordan Clarkson and Ivan Zubak. We also got Jared Dudley and Tyson Chandler's massive contracts trading places with Bismack Biombos and Wesley Amundu tacked on as an afterthought. Troy Daniels and Frank Mason switch three teams and Alec Burks gets swapped straight up for Born Ready. Taking a look at the league leaders, Steph Curry is at the top of the scoring chart with 29.4 points a game. Russell Westbrook though is making another strong case for MVP, averaging a double-double and is only half a rebound away from making that another triple-double. I'd never want to be his teammate, but the guy's an insane athlete. Finally, we take a quick look at the standings with Toronto leading the way. The Hornets with the newly acquired Hassan Whiteside are tied for first along with John Wall and the Wizards. As a Sixers fan, I'm also happy to see that the process is finally paying off with the Sixers right up there as well. Boston, Milwaukee, and Orlando round out the rest of the remaining spots, with Detroit, New York, and Chicago all contending trying to sneak into the playoffs. Unfortunately though, our record is actually not bad enough to be last in the East, with the dumbass Heat at 16 and 42. In the West, we have the Rockets in first with Golden State right behind them. The Clippers are doing surprisingly well after the departure of Chris Paul, and are sitting in third, with the Thunder, Spurs, Pelicans, Timbs, and Blazers filling up the rest of the top eight. Things don't look too good at the bottom though with Dallas, Memphis, and Phoenix all with worse records than us. According to the mock drafts, we currently have Odell Shepard with the fifth pick. The Mavs right now are projected as number one and will understandably take Baldwin with Staples going to the Suns and the Grizzlies getting Mirko Petrovic with the third pick. I'm sticking with what I said in the past videos in that we don't need Staples, but not getting Baldwin or Petrovic is out of the question. I mean, Odell Shepard looks like a monster and seems like someone who would easily go top two or three in any other draft. He's averaging 20 points, 10 boards, 3 steals, and 4 blocks a game, but these other guys have LeBron-like potential. Jackson Baldwin, or the Creek Freak as they're starting to call him, fits that mold perfectly. This guy's averaging 28 points and 11 boards a game, along with 3 steals and 4 blocks. He's also averaging about 5 assists, but from what my scouts have told me, he's got the core vision and handles to drop as many as 15 if he wants to. Mirko is also another unicorn with almost 29 points and 16 and a half boards a game. He's a little light, but is athletic enough to get by stronger, bigger guys. And at 7-1, he's no problem facing up and shooting over small wings who try to guard him. They're comparing him to the Croatian Anthony Davis, but from what I've seen, he looks like the meaner version of Kristaps Porzingis, which is f***ing terrifying. So we really need either of these guys. As I've said before, I'm open to trading anyone and everyone, even Schroeder or Prince. Worst comes to worst, we might even have to throw in some picks, but we're doing whatever it takes.